This content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained on here constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorse, or endorsement, or offer by Draper Gorn Home or any third party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments whatsoever. And uh, you can catch this recording uh, at our lovely media partner, Blockchain Radio, as well as our YouTube channel, the Blockchain Summit. And today's topic is all about building powerful online communities. We have three magnificent pros with us. I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, we can start with Isaiah, go to John, and, and finish with Matt. Well, my name is Isaiah Jackson. I'm the author of Bitcoin in Black America and the co-host of the Gentleman of Crypto Daily Show. Cool. Welcome, John. Uh, I am a co-founder of LunarCrush.com. Um, as we say, without community, there's no crypto. We collect social activity and uh, present it to our users at, uh, at LunarCrush.com. Nice. Last but not least, Matt. Awesome. I'm Matt Wright. I uh, currently work for Consensus. I'm our uh, developer community lead. I uh, was previously at JP Morgan uh, working on uh, Quorum, uh, private version of Ethereum. Cool. And one thing I like to do as we start the show is just hear everybody's background and how you guys kind of got started in crypto. Matt, we can start with you and work to John and finish with Isaiah. Uh, so the Genesis story. Yeah. Uh, previous to JPM, I was working at a company uh, called Angel Hack. Uh, we essentially organized hackathons all around the world. Um, and I was our head of community. And so I was, you know, uh, not only organizing hackathons for Fortune 500s, but was uh, you know doing hackathons in 60 plus different countries. Uh, had a blast, um, a lot of travel, a lot of fun. But then, I think it was around 2015. I did a hackathon for Barclays, and it was on blockchain. And for me, I, it was the first time I heard it. I had no idea what it was, <laughs> um, and so I started talking to some developers, and uh, you know, one of them sat me down and. You know, showed me the documentary. Uh, I forget the documentary. It's the Bitcoin documentary. It's like all over the place. Uh, you all know the one. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's it's like the, I think it's everyone's first uh, you know immersion into holy shit. I should be in, in on this. And that's when I was like, wow, I really want to be you know part of this technology that's you know decentralizing financial infrastructure and you know bringing a lot of this power back to the people. And that's when I kind of, you know, drank the Kool-Aid or, you know, however you want to call it and started really getting into, uh, you know, you know, various projects, uh, you know, that were in blockchain. So I think this was like now 2016 and leading into 2017, um, I slowly started getting to Ethereum and at the time my company wasn't doing anything that was exciting, uh, in the blo blockchain space at that time. Um, so I, you know, just kind of left to go explore what was out there. Um, I started consulting for a buddy who was doing blockchain use cases or, you know, POCs for, uh, for government agencies. Um, and so that was, that was cool for a bit. And then that's kind of around the time when JP Morgan reached out and, you know, we started engaging on, um, you know, enter the enterprise side of, of blockchain and specifically enterprise Ethereum. And that was mind blowing to me uh, when they reached out to me, it was like through LinkedIn. And I honestly, I honestly thought it was spam because it was like JP Morgan, you know, recruiting you for a blockchain job. And I was like, I was like, that's a joke, <laughs> like, like no way in hell. Um, and I was terribly wrong. Like they're doing some incredible things over there. Um, you know, I, I won't talk on, you know, custody or, or tokens or anything like that. But the software infrastructure, um, the way they're trying to, um, and that they've initiated, uh, you know, reformatting how banks talk to one another is, is incredible. Um, so I got to see kind of this full spectrum of, um, you know, uh, the Bitcoin, you know, infrastructure and, you know, um, this, this movement to, to kind of uh, take down banks. And then I got to see, you know, the bank uh, saying, hey, like, that's not quite what we're down for, but. You know, we're we're interested in the software behind it and how we, how can we have, uh, you know, more efficient conversations between banks, whether it's you know sanctions clearing or, or remittance remittance or you know any type of bank process or financial service, um, and so yeah, that was that was my first exposure to it, and you know I've just been on this 
giant Ethereum wave for the past two years, two plus years, um, and just loving everything that's coming out of the of that space, you know, with DeFi and you know, someone mentioned that you know it's not just Ethereum that's doing DeFi and Although that's true, there's so much cool things that we're seeing um, in that space specifically. And um, it, as I'm sure all you can relate to, it's so hard to like absorb all these different ecosystems. <laughs> so I try and stay focused on one. Um, but yeah, it's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm just really enjoying, you know, learning what we're doing in the Ethereum space and, uh, uh, you know, how, how that's done on the enterprise side too. And and you you were part of the transition from JP Morgan to Consensus, right? That whole acquisition period. Yeah, I, I was lucky, man. That was um, that'd be that was actually the only reason I probably got into Consensus. I I actually applied to Consensus in twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen. I played twice. Um, didn't didn't get a, an interview. Uh, and then I worked at JPM for two years, and then we entered the discussions for the acquisition. Um, they acquired. Quorum as part of their enterprise Ethereum offering, um, and uh, yeah, as as you know, it wasn't an aqua hire. Like I wasn't part of the transaction, but you know, it helps open up conversations. And you know, they wanted to bring in folks folks that have been working on the project for for years. And you know, I'm just I've been super close with the community, um, and so now I've got some new challenges uh, inside a more robust uh, organization because at JP Morgan, as you can imagine, um, doing things like hackathons, of, you know, from the bank side was a nightmare. <laughs> I had to deal with all kinds of regulatory and compliance issues. Um, at some point, I just, I just did stuff <laughs> and didn't ask questions. Um, you know, it just, it got crazy. But now being at consensus, they're very uh, forward thinking. So, you know, getting getting in touch with developers and organizing hackathons, even, you know, sending people crypto, you know, you know, to, to execute a bounty at like a hackathon is not uh, a challenge, but at JP Morgan, yeah, it's just, it wasn't, uh, that was kind of the biggest issue to why they got this acquisition underway. Nice. Cool. Glad to have you on. John, give us the rundown about yourself, how you got started in crypto, uh, where, where you're at today. So I, I've asked myself this question quite a lot. I've done a lot of uh, soul searching, trying to figure out when did I start? And I think, I think it goes back to before crypto. When I was a kid, I, I, I obsessively traded baseball cards and learned a lot of the same mechanics that we still use today. Um, you know, you learn, you learn what a store of value looks like. You, you understand um, circulating supply. Um, you understand when there's demand and when there's not. And, and how to sell and when to sell. So a lot of that, I think, started there. Um, and then I think when you go forward, I think, well, what got me excited about crypto? Well, let's go back to QE1. QE1, the very first one, um, when my house value was cut in half. And I learned, I learned, wow, the government's got some work to do. And so that, that pissed me off quite a bit. That was fun. Um, and then got into, I was working at an ad agency, uh, working, I was actually working on something with The Walking Dead. And, and a major auto brand. And one of the guys I was working with was, was talking about this Bitcoin thing. And I, I really should set up an account on this website called Mount Gox. And um, so started, started the journey then and then started researching, gosh, what's, what's this Ethereum thing I'm hearing about? Some of my friends got in the ICO, but what, what, what's going on here? How did, I, how did I miss that one? Um, then Monero, then Litecoin and, and researching these things and finding that, um, wow, I'm, I'm finding them all on Twitter. I'm finding them all on Reddit, what, what's going on. And still everyone in the real world around me is telling me I'm crazy. Um, asking me, are you, are you a hacker? Are you, are you like an anarchist of some sort? Like, what, why, why are you so into this stuff? Isn't it for drugs? Years of that, years of this must be drug money. And, and so um, still ignored them, um, still stayed true to it, true to it and, uh, and then realized, you know what? We keep finding, brought some of my friends along with me. And then uh, started realizing, you know, uh, we're finding all this stuff on social. Can we collect more than just who we're following? Can we collect everything that is, say, on Twitter or Reddit? Can we do that? And so out of our own, like, investing purposes, uh, started collecting social information and started realizing, wow, this is it's much cooler to, to see this over time. Because when you're on your feed right now, you only kind of see what's going on at the moment with who you're following, maybe a few degrees apart. 
And so we, we said, you know, what if we can kind of bring that further along? And uh, here we are today um, collecting, you know, in the last few days, it's been like one and a half to two million posts a day um, that we each score for sentiment, for spam, for engagement, for who's most influential. Um, and it's it's been fascinating the last few weeks. I mean, we with the whole Wall Street bets uh, scenario here, um, it, it's brought a whole new light to what actually drives uh, behavior. And, uh, you know, we're seeing this really like, social activity that's actually starting to create movements and it's starting to um, actually engage and do stuff together um, in a decentralized way which is so exciting and it's been really cool to you know we, we do not track stocks but it's been really amazing to watch something like a dogecoin the last uh, the last week here especially two weeks um, to watch the correlations between social activity and price movements um, to, to see where it's near perfect a near perfect correlation um, and that, that says a lot. So it's really exciting. So we've gone from like, why should I care about social activity? Um, even if I told you, if you watched this stuff, you'd outperform anyone. Don't care. Why should I care? Well, this now people are going from that to sign me up. I'm all in. I, I want to track the social activity on, on all my favorite cryptos. So that's been my journey. And, and John, you guys kind of created Lunar Crush in the beginning, if I remember correctly, is to benefit more of these hedge funds and these larger institutions. But it seems like a lot of like the, the B2C has taken over and people like like me, Isaiah, Matt, and everyone else on crypto Twitter relying on your tools, right? Is that is that more of the direction that it's taken over? You know, it's funny. Yes, yes, except for the fact that even even with that focus, um, we're getting a lot of API signups because we do sell our API. We have a WebSocket API for real-time data, and then we have an hourly API for uh, it's a lower cost. Um, we're even getting students that are trying to just experiment with, uh, you know, building different applications with social data. Um, and that's just like soaring also. We, we almost do nothing to promote it. So we may, we may want to focus a little more there. But yeah, we're focused on really creating transparency and value um, for your average investor out there. Um, and that's of all shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, like some people just kicking the tires and have never bought uh, anything and others who are day trading every day. And so we're building a lot of tools for that. Um, you know, lots of different applications around that. Amazing. Isaiah, take it away. Tell, tell me a little bit about how you got started in, in crypto because uh, you have a very fascinating story and I, I always love hearing it and uh, kind of where you are today. Uh, go ahead. All right. So let's take it back to 2013. Um, a scary time in Bitcoin and crypto here, history. Uh, like John said, everybody thought it was multi-level marketing, it was a scam, it was a Ponzi scheme, you were a drug dealer, all of these things uh, back then. So I had a roommate, I was fresh out of college at the time, uh, 23, 24 years old, and I had a roommate who worked for a, a financial institution, I won't give it away, but they had a meeting about Bitcoin and to him it was too uh, tech involved or, or too much uh, tech you know, needed to understand it. And because that's my background, uh, I was actually teaching computer science, that's my degree, and I was actually teaching high school at the time. He was like, hey, you may understand this thing called Bitcoin, we discussed it, it's kind of for tech people, whatever. So he passed it off to me. I read the white paper that night, and I watched Max Kaiser the next day, who if you know anything about Max Kaiser, a uh, very, <laughs> very eccentric figure, I think he can convince anybody to buy Bitcoin. Uh, so I just so happened to watch him first, saw an article from the Winklevoss twins about the price of Bitcoin, and my entry into Bitcoin was like most people. I thought I could make money from it. Uh, however, once I realized how the mechanics of Bitcoin work, uh, the tech side of it, that's what kept me around. Because like most people, when you're introduced to Bitcoin, if you're in it for money, yes, it may look good at first, but if you were around in 2013, we went to $1,000, people were picking out Lambos or whatever, and then the price crashed to $200 and stayed there for about two years which is when I studied uh, most of what I know about Bitcoin, 2014, 2015, and even 2016. So from that point, decided to educate others, uh, show them that Bitcoin is more than just an investment, that cryptocurrency is the future. Uh, began the Gentleman of Crypto in 2017, a daily show. We're at episode 656 now. Um, and we've been doing that show uh, almost four years in June. And then uh, of course, also went on to write three Bitcoin starter guides and uh, two books, Bitcoin in Black America, uh, first and second edition. And from 
you know, where I started to where I am now, I just want to remind people that I thought I was late. Uh, and a lot of people who start in this industry, they have this view that, hey, uh, it's too late. The price is too high. And I was, I just try to remind them, like, hey, when I was 200, when it was $200 when I bought in, I was about to wait for a dip to 150. <laughs> like, I really thought it was too late, like the guys before me. So I just want to encourage anybody, if you think you're too late, everybody says that 10 years from now, people will look back and say, hey, I, I thought it was too late then too. So it's all good. So online communities, obviously we can see, can move markets, John. You, you guys keep preaching at Lunar Crush that there's no crypto without community, right? And we've seen this truth most more recently unfold with the whole Reddit versus Wall Street takeover. Uh, and it's something, a uh, shameless plug, that we invest in heavily, whether it be our time, our money uh, at Draper Grown Home. I kind of like to hear from each of you on this. Is it, is it fair for me to say that it's because of the sheer passion and conviction of crypto's community that kind of largely motivated your personal involvement in the industry? And right, everybody obviously has their own financial incentives to getting involved. But because we are talking about community over here, right, and building communities, would you guys say that a lot of your involvement, a lot of your motivation kind of came from seeing all this action, this, this fire coming online from peers around you? I mean, my, my perspective is that it's not so much, crypto is amazing. Um, it's almost the macro that drew me, that drove me in. Like the macro picture, when you kind of look at, you know, like money printing. And again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the housing crash in 07, 08. That was like at my age, I mean, I'm, I'm in my early 40s. That was a rude awakening to life. And you thought it was a rosy picture before that. Like things were great. In fact, before that, from 2000 uh, up until then, I remember housing prices double, credit was cheap. Um, I mean, you could get a loan without any any stated income. I mean, it was just it was just a different time. And I I almost feel like you know what what you see, and we we even see this on the Wall Street Vets comments. Um, there that started that lit the fire on a lot of people in there. There's a lot of people in there that it, it goes back way back then. But I, I think what's different now versus then is crypto didn't exist. There was no narrow exit off of the system back then. And now there now it exists. And and it's it's really fascinating because I mean, like when you go back to when this like 2010, 2012, 2013, like like early 2010s when Bitcoin started, you'd hear people um like like Tim Draper. You'd hear these people talk about, you know, greatest wealth transfer in human history is going to happen. I mean, we just tweeted this a little bit ago on our account, but like it's happening. It's happening. All the things that that we would, were told and we're talking about and why this exists, it's now come to fruition. It's exactly happening. Um, look at look at an all time chart of Bitcoin. You'll see it's happening. And so it, I'm, I'm really curious what happens next, because now this money is in a lot of different hands that that used to never have money at all. And so it's going to be a really interesting time um, when the little guy is now the big guy and the big guys are now going to be the little guys. And so um, it, it's really an interesting time. Yeah, I, I kind of love, I love to hear from Matt, Isaiah, feel free to jump in. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think that's what initially got me uh, was exactly um, what John mentioned was, uh, you know, seeing how, how you're empowering the people to, you know, be able to uh, orchestrate these systems and, and manage, you know, their own, um, their own finances. They can be their own bank. Like, you know, I'm speaking of the choir here, but um, that idea alone and kind of now what I'm seeing with DAOs is quite interesting and how we're seeing community driven um, infrastructure where you don't need a single point of failure or like a you know single stakeholder to kind of be the gatekeeper. Um, if you want to you know access financial services in on today's internet you can now do that. Um, we're not fully there uh, in, in a lot of ways but uh, it's quite interesting to see that you know, you're empowering people in these communities versus the other way around. Um, I think the first uh, insight I had on that was, I don't know if you read this book, Spider versus Starfish, uh, but just talks about like decentralization in history. 
um, and how you know systems that have organically uh, been decentralized versus centralized, um, you know how they've succeeded and how that's kind of created new ways for humans to uh, communicate with one another and one another and make decisions. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, like like why did Wikipedia be successful or why why was Napster successful? Um, and now why is this new financial system? Um, having traction and getting legs. Um, it's because it's it's driven by a community, and you know there's no uh, there's no point where you could just you know uh, attack attack the core of it and it would stop working. You'd have to kill it all, <laughs> which I it, you know with the community and how much traction we've had, I don't think it's possible. Um, so yeah, that's what got me first was just seeing how a group of people could um, overtake. Um, and, and uh, you know, be the stakeholder. Yeah, have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love what Matt said about community. Bitcoin has proven that the community is strong enough to last through all of the FUD from media, all of the times that Bitcoin has quote unquote died. And I think uh, crypto and Bitcoin in general, long term will be here to last. And I think that because of the community that's here, none of us work for the Bitcoin company, so to say, or, you know, we're we're drawn in because of things that we believe we weren't recruited so to say so that just shows that there's a community that's here we're, we're here to stay in that long term uh most people are not leaving and you know next generation same thing you know mo more people gravitate towards cryptocurrency and we're seeing that now definitely yeah and and because this whole session is about tips i, I want to give tangible uh like notes points that people can actually take away and they could be like, okay, this is what's this is what goes into building a powerful online community. And John, you you can bring a lot of data over here. Matt, you can bring a lot of experience, and Isaiah as well. You guys all build your own niche communities. Uh, so let's let's kind of take it from particularly looking at a community's growth from a short term, mid term, and and long term mature, maturity point of view. Right? What what are some metrics you guys use to measure a healthy and growing community? And now again, this could be data driven. This could be gut feeling based. Let me give examples of what I mean by those three levels. Short term being a new project like Idle, who has no affiliation with blockchain, but it was just a random early stage project uh, whose token listed in December of 2020, super early. Midterm, a project like Ave, who, who, who's experienced amazing growth over the last year and has essentially become a DeFi blue chip. And long term, a project like Ethereum and its birth of NFTs, DeFi, et cetera. Right, so all three different stages, all projects building in crypto. What are some metrics you guys use to, to measure the health and the growth uh, of, of developing communities? And feel free, anyone to chime in. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah. So a few things, like for starters, you know, community in itself is so hard to measure. Um, and it's very unique from community to community. Like if you're working strictly with open source software developers or you're just working with uh, crypto enthusiasts or, or product users, like there's definitely different buckets and different measurements for all these. Um, and then there's this like ultimate sense of community that it just, you can never measure. Like I have times where I just, something great happens with the community, like a uh, one of our ambassadors like, for example, one of our ambassadors the other day translated like an entire deck in Mandarin. And like, how do you measure that? <laughs> like, um, it's quite crazy. Um, but for us, like since we have so many open source projects, a lot of the numbers that we look at are like in general, just community size. So um, like we have a discord, we measure like how large, uh, how large the you know community member pool is and how, how much that's growing. Uh, we try and track, you know, the percentage of those that are developers. Uh, we track like, you know, how many people are attending our meetups, uh, you know, how many meetups we have. And then it all kind of boils down to you know, how many contributors we have on our, on our projects. Because um, our goal, you know, in the open source is getting people to contribute, um, getting developers to use our products. So we kind of see it as a funnel. And it's you know, similar to marketing, but, you know, the end all is, you know, how do you, like for us, it's like, how do you drive a developer community um, to be helpful to one another and to, uh, you know, create synergies in the ecosystem? 
Isaiah John. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say just to say to build a community, one thing you need is consistency, doing something over and over so that people realize that you're here to stay. And once that's achieved, uh, one of the long term goals I think that happens is how we measure it is how many people, quote unquote, stick. And some of the things we use with our podcast, with our YouTube show is how many people come back consistently. And because we get new people every day, we know that the regulars are always there, plus new people. So that's how we measure it long term. I would say midterm, uh, one thing that uh, I definitely do <clears throat> with our community, with the gentleman of crypto, as well as the black community with Bitcoin, is that midterm, I like to see how many people have actually, ha actually have skin in the game, have actually purchased Bitcoin, are actually trying to use it. And we provide educational services of how to store it, how to earn it, all of these things, how many people are actually using it. We use that data based on either signups through um, webinars or through signups through uh, <clears throat> our website. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways to get those metrics, but you definitely want to stay consistent so that that information is flowing in uh, consistently. From, from our side, we, I think we look at it both wide and, and we look at it deep. So we look at it like how many coins can we track social activity for? Um, when we track public social activity uh, from Twitter, Medium, Reddit, YouTube, um, really we probably know we do have more news than anyone. Um, and that that's because of how we collect it. Um, we have news from thousands of websites. Um, and what, how we do that is we actually look at every URL that's posted in every social post and we, we basically spider it and we understand what it's about. And so um, when we look at us collecting social activity per coin, like we'll pick on Ethereum here, um, we, we look at everything that says Ethereum, the ticker ETH, hashtag Ethereum, anything related to Ethereum whatsoever. And we would say that's social volume, that's a social mention. And we look at those on an hourly basis. So how many social mentions in every social post that we collected were there for Ethereum during that period of time? And then we go deeper and we say, how many social engagements um, were there in those posts, both then and a little bit trailing? So that looks something like, you know, if someone posts something about Ethereum, say on Twitter, and there's no one commenting on it, it's dead. When, some, when someone actually comments and another person comments and retweets and likes and keeps going and going, and same thing on Reddit, that just keeps going, that's engagement and we measure the engagement. And so that depth tells you that there's a, there's, a, there's a really active community that's participating versus say a lot of empty posts and we see them all day long, these, these spammy posts that are totally empty. Um, and check out this coin, ticker, 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 25 tickers. Um, you know, and, and so we, we also look at, when I say we look deep, we then use machine learning to understand the posts. We understand the sentiment from very bullish to very bearish, to perhaps it's just neutral. We also try to understand if it's spam. And, and so we go deep on all of that. Um, currently we're doing it for about 2,100 coins. Um, that's gonna increase to about six to 8,000 in the next few months um, as we scale up. Um, and so I'd, I'd say also another big piece is we also look at who's posting. Um, it's one thing to say that like, you know, if I did, for example, a, a, a Litecoin post, um, it's gonna do okay. But if Charlie Lee does a Litecoin post, it's probably gonna do really, really well. And so Charlie Lee is probably influential for Litecoin for the periods of time in which he posts. If Charlie Lee stops posting, he's losing his influence. And so we, we measure the engagement and the activity of all of those posts. And then we actually classify influencers objectively on the site by time and engagement and influence. Yeah, it's interesting because let's say a project is starting out now and nobody really, no one really has heard about it, right, John? Uh, how many social posts does it actually take for you guys to to uh, to get like that light bulb, be like, oh, there's a new project. People are actually talking about it. Like, what what's that number? If there's a number, so a lot of it on our end is is listening. Um, I'll give an example. Um, there's a project called Reef that's built on Polkadot recently, and we saw we saw Reef early on because people were talking about it, and we were listening. And our current methodology has been wait until we have market activity. Um, so I guess I'll do an announcement. I'll spill the beans a little bit on your show here. Um, we're going to be going deeper and saying we can start to show that activity even without market data. And so what's nice about that is um, as Reef, I'm using them as a piggy, you know, uh, I'm picking on them. Um, if Reef wanted to get listed on exchanges, uh, they have a hard time doing that up front. You know, it costs a lot of money. 
it takes time. You have to convince these individual exchanges. Well, what if you could walk into the door and say, hey guys, we actually have a verifiable community going here. Um, and so we're building tools out to do that um, for those very early stage projects. And I mean, I'll say, I, I was shocked to know, I mean, at least in, on our radar, there are almost 12,000 coins now, 12,000. And so um, that number was like eight or 9,000 at our last, when we last looked. And so this data keeps growing. And so, no, they're not all going to be successful, but some will be, and some will be huge. And, you know, if we were talking about uh, ETH Lend not that long ago, before it was Ave, you know, uh, it would have been a tiny project trying to get listed on an exchange or something like that, right? I mean, um, they certainly weren't listed on Coinbase. So, um, so pretty, pretty interesting times. But yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely focused on those early stage projects and we're going to do more for them. Yeah, Matt, I, I think you have particularly such a unique story uh, from doing hackathons to then transitioning into Quorum's community. You were literally on the ground. I remember seeing posts on your LinkedIn. You were literally on the ground recruiting, hosting hackathons, traveling from conference to conference, uh, all the way leading up towards its acquisition by consensus. Uh, many times it kind of seemed like it was like a one man show. How did you measure your success? I know, I know you talked a little bit about that, but how did you measure your success, let, or, let alone like the growth of Quorum's community? And follow-up question, has that changed since you've transitioned to consensus? Yeah, and, and the times, like, you know, with COVID, no one traveling, it's definitely different now. Um, <clears throat> and the nature of where the project sits, um, it's a little background, a little context. Um, you know when we when it was just a jp morgan project it was uh you know we had, we had a slack channel um and that was like our key driver so we would just you know drive enterprise developers to slack um and we just have like technical faqs and um our engineers would respond to the community there um and i would be on twitter but like you know since it wasn't like a token or anything there wasn't uh there wasn't a lot of like complexity to it. Um, it was, you know, pretty much just heads down, like protocol engineering uh, questions. And then, so when I would go out to these events, yeah, I just, you know, start funneling developers into, uh, into Slack. Um, now the way it's different is, you know, uh, like I, I specifically work on consensus quorum, which is our like enterprise offering for, for Ethereum. Uh, which now has two clients. It has um, the Go Quorum, which was previously JP Morgan's uh, Ethereum, private version of Ethereum, and they have Hyperledger Bezu. Um, and so like those both have different chat groups, like they, Hyperledger, they use uh, Rocket Chat. And then for, uh, you know, we were using Slack for, for Go Quorum. And so now I'm like having to merge that and we're looking at Discord and that's been our like next, um, uh platform where we can start measuring like the traffic coming in for the community um but but yeah to john's point too like we have like we're up on social we have like all that you know uh um that type of engagement and then we have this different layer which is like our chat groups and we're trying to like package that into one which is discord um but that's kind of where we heard everyone and where we try to like drive more developers create more engagements um and it's open it's not like a private community or anything so it's it's a little more closed than social media but um it's an open environment and everyone can join and you know we, we engage folks there yeah and i remember back in like 2017 the ico days uh, and Isaiah, i'd love to hear your point of view on this too people would go into telegram group chats and determine the the viability of a project based off how many people were actually in the chat Right. Do you, you guys do you guys see that still as a as a as a thing running your own communities, scoping out new projects, um, or obviously there's more data. There's there's projects being built now, but like, it's obviously evolved from that point on, hasn't it? Even though I I know a lot of people still go on to Telegram groups and and they try to see how many numbers are in the chat. I, mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of walk me through that. Like, go ahead. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask, I was like, who's, um, who's pro Telegram, pro Discord on here? <laughs> it, it's, I've got like so many damn channels for like platforms. It's just nuts. Yeah. Isaiah, I, I'd love yeah. to go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it's definitely one of those things where over time it changes, but I, I remember those days in Telegram, literally people were just scoping to see which groups were the biggest, which one would have the next pump. 
whatever yeah. it is. I think we're sort of past those days, especially ICO days. Uh, a lot of ICOs got taken down by the SEC, yeah. and unfortunately, you know, you have a lot of dead projects left people with money just sitting out there. So uh, I think those days are not gone completely, but they have shifted because people use Signal now. People use, you know, other other means to communicate. So uh, it hasn't gone away completely, but the ethos of the crypto community is still alive, <laughs> definitely. Uh, just not what? as much as 2017 because that was crazy. I mean. I don't, I, we won't see the ICO market again. You just can't have people raising millions of dollars for a project with just a website. Literally, yeah. no, <laughs> like no product, no nothing. So, and now, yeah, now I mean, you have Clubhouse too, right? Clubhouse. Yeah, we have Clubhouse. I think that's a, a little bit more distinguished, a little bit more, better information coming there uh, than the ICO days. But hey, the, the same thing happens uh, over and over because, like John just said, there's how many? Twelve thousand cryptos. Uh, yeah, th there's no way all of them are legit and have <laughs> have have the up and up as far as their business. Uh, but for those who do, they will succeed. And for those who don't, Telegram still works for them, I guess. I, I want to add a couple notes to this. So yeah, Clubhouse is is crazy and awesome, and and I love the fact that it takes actual effort to participate. You're not just going yeah. da 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 spam hiding, right? Yeah. Like you're actually like having to be thoughtful, or no one's going to listen, right? It's it's like it requires extensive effort and knowledge on a topic to talk about it for a long time. Um, we were on last night and there was like 500 people like listening and talking and asking questions and coming in and out. It was awesome. Um, but what, what we notice is, so doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what we're talking about, what channel, like 90% of it approximately ends up on Twitter in some form or another. It like, if someone's doing something on YouTube, they're posting a link on Twitter. If someone's doing something on Clubhouse tonight at 7 p.m., they're promoting it on Twitter. And so Twitter is like this hub. Um, like if they have a Telegram or a Discord, they're posting a link to it on Twitter. And so it, we, we see Twitter as this like this kind of hub and the others are spokes. Even if they are independent, it does end up on Twitter, uh, at least to a major, major extent. To the point of, I mean, I don't have the number in front of me, but it is something like 90%. So um, that's a pretty important thing. Another important note, that we've observed because we do track um, who posts what and what coins they're talking about. We measure all the major media outlets, right? Um, and I'll just tell you that like, um, it, and again, it, it's possible we missed a few coins or maybe we didn't have them in our system or whatever, um, but we do track the top like over 2000 coins now. And I can tell you that the major media outlets over the past year covered approximately a hundred coins each total. And about 80% of that, that, that content was like the top five projects. So if you just do the math and you say that there's how many coins in the market? Thousands, right? 97% of them aren't getting any news at all on a yearly basis over the last year. Wow. So there's this gaping hole in the market where, um, social is filling that void. So as important as news is, it is not focusing on the little projects. And whereas they may focus on, on DeFi or one or two projects, and of course they're gonna talk about Aave, of course they're gonna talk about Uniswap. But if you're one of these lower level projects, you're getting no to very little coverage. And that very little coverage, if you think about the frequency and speed of this market, it's like to have that happen on July 2nd, and now here we are, nothing, nothing, nothing. That activity is happening on social. And, and crypto moves at the speed of social. Um, and so, and it's awfully hard to report in real time on news when you need to um, love news. It's great for conviction, but if I'm tra a trader, if I have to wait for an article to be published, to, be, to have a nice illustration drawn up from an artist on, on the team, post it to staging in our content management system, then it gets deployed. How many minutes or hours is that? And so that's already been unveiled on Twitter hours ago. And so what we see is this lag um, a lot. We continually see a lag and we continually see a gap on many, many coins. Um, so that's, that's a problem in, in the space right now. It's a major problem that the community needs to fill the void for news. Yeah. Isaiah, I, I wanna kind of jump into your background more uh, and your experience with community building. Uh, you consistently talk about your, your passion and efforts in, in Bitcoin and how they boil down to this one single goal, and that is being a voice of education uh, and inspiration for the black community and how 20 and, and how from 20 years from now, uh, you'll be happy when you look back and you're able to say that black people didn't miss this financial train. You've gone on many times on 
on Twitter talking about that. Uh, that within yourself, uh, that within itself, excuse me, is very powerful. Uh, and it's as if you're like, you're taking the responsibility, responsibility upon yourself to grow that community, right? And I see you very actively as a voice in that. How do you measure the effectiveness behind your messaging? Like what, what does that kind of boil down to? Oh yeah. So, I mean, one way to measure it is, for example, black Bitcoin billionaires on Clubhouse, biggest Bitcoin group in the world. That's one way to measure it. So that, I mean, that right there is, is shows you that black people are interested. Um, you know, Coinbase, they did a poll. 75% of black people who were polled said they are interested in crypto. Uh, however, the education is not there. So uh, even though it feels like I've taken it upon myself, it's actually a lot of black people in the space that get overlooked uh, for one reason or another. And uh, a lot of the work that they do, bringing black people into the space is needed because if Bitcoin is for everybody, then you're going to need everybody. And unfortunately, uh, the old financial system did not include everybody. It was very exclusive. And even getting to a point where you're part of that financial system has taken hundreds of years. Like, we don't have that time. And uh, I think the sense of urgency that the Black community has coupled with the group economics, with the scarcity of Bitcoin, with, you know, the promise of cryptocurrency, DeFi in the future, all of that is happening at the exact same time. So building a community around that is actually pretty easy once the education is there. Because you have to realize, again, if Bitcoin is going to be mainstream, you need everybody. So I feel like that voice is needed. And I, I just feel like I was lucky enough to learn about Bitcoin early enough. I've gone through enough of the, I've, I've seen the hacks. I've seen the exchanges go down. I've seen all the bad news. So that's why I feel like I can lend my voice to help the, the black community and to see a familiar face because rep representation matters. Yeah. And, and how does that kind of tie into the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. No, I was, I was just going to ask you there, like, you know, what can the ecosystem do to like further help? No, uh, just keep working. Uh, I mean, honestly, the, the biggest thing black people have been pushing for it has been uh, equal opportunity, not equal outcome. Uh, equal outcome is is a farce. That's not going to happen. Uh, equal opportunity is what we need. And I think that Bitcoin levels that playing field where if you use Bitcoin, if you use cryptocurrency, you have a chance to not miss it. As I say, oftentimes, like Adam said, uh, we missed the tech boom. We missed a lot of the big financial boom of the, the 70s and 80s, uh, the tech boom of the 90s and 2000s. This time, we, if we didn't miss it, there's nothing for anybody else to really do for us. We just need the equal opportunity. I think we have that. And I think the only thing holding people back is jumping into the space. Once you do that, I have not met one single black person who has gotten to the Bitcoin space and regretted it. Not one. Uh, only people who got scammed or people who didn't understand it. But everybody else, uh, again, there's no really hope needed, just equal opportunity. I think Bitcoin does that. Yeah, and how does that kind of tie into the second edition of your book? You just launched it. I remember seeing a post it on, on your Twitter. Of you, you got like a plane to fly a banner across <laughs> Miami. <laughs> how does yeah, that yeah. the second edition of your book also in this new show that you have coming out with Coindesk? Take me through that a bit. Oh, yeah. So, well, the banner that was flown was really to get Mayor Suarez's uh, attention in Miami, and it worked. Two hours later, uh, he hit me up on Twitter, and he said, <laughs> said would love to connect. So it worked. And because I'm an independent author, I had to get a little creative. Uh, so I'm just glad that that, that, that worked. But uh, as far as the second version, it's an upgrade from the first. It's more information, totally different book. And what I think it does is it gives the correct information to the Black community not some of the stuff that comes just from, from anybody. And I, I judge people off of merit, but I also believe that if you get it from somebody who has the same background as you, it's a lot easier for you to digest. And we are still dealing with humans. In a vacuum, Bitcoin is great for everybody. Anybody can learn about it. But because we are humans, I think that this message needs, needs to go out to the black community from someone who's black, who's seen you know, some, our struggles and can learn about the different uh, ways Bitcoin can uh, actually help us long-term. So. A lot of good things in there. Uh, Bitcoin is reparations, Bitcoin for generational wealth, how to earn Bitcoin without trading, uh, how to run a node, creating a private wallet, all of these things are the second version. Well, nice. And great. Kind of walk me through this brand new uh, show you have coming up too with Coindesk TV. Ah, yes. Um, Community Crypto on Coindesk TV starting later this month. We get live uh, meetup groups to meet and discuss topics. Um, and eventually I want to sort of be, I guess, the Bourdain of Bitcoin, travel to different places to see how Bitcoin can affect local communities. Because in America, we're kind of spoiled. Like we all look at it like, oh, it's an investment. I can make money. But you go to some of these places, they're risking their life to mine Bitcoin or 
they're creating a new financial system because of decades of colonialism. So that's what Community Crypto will focus on and I can't wait to present it on Coindesk TV. That's a very unique topic. I love that. It's great. Good. Nice, nice job. Uh, guys, I, I want to be respectful of each of your time. We've had a really, really great session. Uh, let me jump to the QA really quick. I know we have a we have a couple points over here. Um, let's see. This one comes from Thomas. We've had a more prosperous, what is that? Prosperous, excuse me, generation over time until the boomer generation broke this trend. But recent developments gave me a renewed hope for the future generations. What are your thoughts on this? I guess the transition from the boomer generation to this new future generation and, and the hope and the inspiration that kind of Bitcoin has set forth for everyone for this new financial system. I mean, it, it's exciting, right? It's, it's exciting. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it's sort of what we were talking about where, I mean, you know, I, like I find it funny over the last little bit here, like, you know, people were pumping stocks that are like GameStop. Come on, guys. AMC. Come on, guys. You're making Wall Street rich. Who owns those stocks, right? Like you're actually pumping more money into the system, right? But but pumping it into crypto, actually, I love that. I think that's awesome. That's that's much smarter because you're you're not throwing more money back into Wall Street. Um, <laughs> I you know it, what's interesting is when you look at something like DeFi. It, imagine us having this conversation a year ago, and then imagine it today, right? Imagine all of the the billions that are that are locked up right now in DeFi, and I don't even know what the number was last year. It was much let's just say much much lower um yeah and it's it, you know it's interesting when you think of where that's going a year from now five years from now ten years from now just directionally and and you think of how like communities are creating movements now very quickly um and they're engaging very quickly and and making things happen man what an exciting environment um i think where this gets interesting um you know, we talk about things being borderless. Well, those that are creating the borders probably aren't going to like it. And I think that's where this gets real fun. Um, and who knows? Who knows? Who knows what happens? But we saw a taste of it in the last few weeks here. Um, you I, in my opinion, that is a, a like tiny case study of where this is going to go. Yeah, and it's cool. exciting. Yeah. Matt, Matt, Isaiah, you guys have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm just, I'm excited for DeFi. Um, <clears throat> I, I mentioned in the chat, but, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in emerging markets. Uh, like, typically been speaking Spanish since I was a kid, so I'm very close to that culture. And, you know, their banking systems have, have taken advantage of them for, for centuries. <laughs> um, you get uh, predatory, you know, lending rates. Uh, and you know you, you can't trust your government you can't trust your banks um being able to tap into the first world's financial services um, something as simple as a high yield savings account um with all you needing is a uh you know internet connection i think is going to be an incredible uh revolution honestly to the financial industry and to the internet industry um so i'm just ecstatic there is a bull run going on so that people are waking up and it's catching their eye but very excited to see what happens when people who haven't had access to these types of tools uh you know are, are then able to kind of take take a more control of their life and their um and their financial well-being for sure isaiah oh i'm, I'm with you matt um definitely with you john i think DeFi is Definitely something that can, you know, turn around decades of uh, discrimination in the economic market. Uh, the fact that the only thing you need to participate is the collateral. And if that's cryptocurrency, there's no need for anything else. There's no need to know your zip code or your race or whatever. Who cares? If you have the collateral, you get the money. And I think DeFi solves that problem. I think as we build more in the future and better products come about uh, with Ethereum, with Bitcoin, with other blockchains, I think DeFi will definitely be the way towards an open financial system where anybody can participate because i think we kind of underestimate what it's going to look like when everybody can participate in the financial market we've never seen that before so we can't even kind of fathom how how much of an impact this will have globally so i am interested to see that and i love the fact that we are a part of this space it's a great time to be alive <laughs> yeah i love it uh this one comes from john kim 
In many communities, people are interested in slash even aligned around similar interests or values, but they're often just bumping into slash against each other. What does real blockchain community look like? That's a good question, John. Diverse, global, active, and uh, definitely innovative. I would say that's a, yeah. a good blockchain community. Okay, Matt? Great, great question. I, I, I'd bucket, like on top of that, I'd bucket them into um, users, developers, and like stakeholders potentially. I don't know. I don't know what that last one would be. It'd be like, um, you know, project leads, but, you know, I, I typically deal with developers or um, users. Uh, I, I look at the whole thing like, like rings. Um, you know, if you think of yourself getting into crypto back in day one and you're just, you've got this curiosity going and that may have meant from any standpoint, that may have been, you maybe you were a developer um, or maybe you're an investor or maybe you had no idea what this thing was, but you're just kind of fascinated. Um, and I, I kind of look at it as that's like an outer ring and then you kind of get deeper and deeper and deeper into this thing. And, and it, you, you kind of start to experience the innovation going on across all of these projects. Um, I, I think, I think there's another interesting piece that that we've seen. Um, you know, we've seen these like maximalists for this coin or that coin. They're butting heads, especially um, on um, on Clubhouse. <laughs> there's a lot of arguments going on on there. Um, but I think if you back away from that and go, "Wow, there's so much innovation going on," you know, you might see it in a project you hate, but think that, "Wow, that's pretty cool what they just did." Um, and so I, I, I think innovation comes from everywhere. But um, another thing that's also interesting is we've seen the community just about triple in the past two months. The amount of conversation we've seen come from three times more people. Um, we've probably all had our friends ask us about crypto. And I think that's where, that's where this gets really, I'm, I'm fascinated about because I even work, we probably all do it too. We work on our own pitch, right? You can't meet with everyone asking you, hey, should I buy Dogecoin? Like, you know, you can't, you can't do it. You don't have time. Um, where do you send them? What's the right place to send them? Um, what's the right material for them to read? Um, how do they get started? What exchange is right for them if they just want to get their feet wet? You know, should they, I, I mean, it's probably not like wise to say like their first thing should be to get into NFTs. Um, they may get there on their own, but um, and maybe they're an artist and that is the first place they go. I don't know. But, but I, I do think that it, we have to be very cognizant of the community. If we were again meeting back in October, there's, there's now three times more people listening to you, three times. And those people are not who you thought that, I mean, we would have had the same discussion, probably saying the same things back then. And now it's, it's becoming mass. It's just becoming everyone. Um, so I think that's probably an interesting kind of note on who the community is. It's, it's everyone, which is beautiful. It's awesome. Amazing. Before we wrap it up, uh, Isaiah, Matt, John, let us know where we can find you, learn more about what you're working on, what you're building. Uh, we can start with you, Isaiah, go to Matt, and then John. Oh, yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at Bitcoin Zay, on Instagram at Bitcoin Zay LLC. Uh, I have Community Crypto coming on Coindesk TV, The Gentleman of Crypto Daily on YouTube. Uh, Bitcoin in Black America is out now, and uh, we will have the Bitcoin in Black America tour starting in June. So I'll see you in, in Miami, Adam, definitely. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. I want to come join you guys. <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I love Miami. Um, yeah, so find me on Twitter. Uh, it's Mateo underscore ventures. Uh, I'll post my Discord here as well. Feel free to reach out. If you have any questions on like developing on these uh, DeFi tools uh, with Ethereum, sorry, I can't help you with any other projects, but um, you know, general curiosity of the ecosystem uh, and blockchain industry as a whole, feel free to reach out, um, Twitter or Discord. Um, I, I'm just going to write it in the chat too, to make it easy, but you can find us at Lunar Crush on Twitter. Um, and you can find us at lunarcrush.com. We're signing up is totally free. Um, we're also, I mean, we're pretty much everywhere. We're even on Pinterest, believe it or not. Um, and we're on, we're on YouTube. Uh, tomorrow we do a live stream. Uh, who's tomorrow's avalanche. Uh, last week we had Algorand. Um, so we're, we're constantly doing a bunch of live streams. So, uh, lots of stuff going on. Nice. And one final cheers to everyone. Thank you for being on Blockchain and Booze. Before I let everyone go, uh, really quick, my favorite part of Blockchain and Booze is the networking session. 
Uh, for those who are brand new, who are watching the live stream, feel free to join in live. This is a lot of fun. Uh, basically, everyone that's been watching live can now meet each other. So before I end presentation mode, uh, you guys need to make sure you have your cameras on and your microphones on. Uh, and when I end presentation mode, we'll basically be scattered around all these different colorful tables where we'll be able to bounce from chair to chair and meet everyone that's been watching. So have your cameras on, have your microphones on. We'll see you next week. Guys, you killed it. Thank you so much. Cheers. Oh, cheers again. Everybody. Thanks for having us.